second song is God Will Make a Way. How many of us know that God will make a way? He will make Amen. a way, right? Amen. Good evening and welcome to uh, the sixth night of our uh, lectures on searching for truth. And uh, I realize that we are rapidly uh, coming to the end of these ones, but we have a good news and uh, we always uh, happy to share the good news and I, we will share it later. Uh, today uh, our topic will be uh, truth about death. It's not a pleasant subject, but uh, we, this is the reality of life that we face, and uh, it's good to know what the Bible tells about uh, that. And uh, as we have done before, today also we will look at uh, the Bible with uh, uh, Paul Douglas and uh, answer this question or share the truth about uh, death. Shall we just bow our heads as we pray? Our Heavenly Father, we are thankful to you because we have this privilege that we can come together to study your word. And Lord, as we have promised, bless us with your presence. Send your Holy Spirit that we would realize that your word is living and active and touching our hearts and our minds and transforming our lives. So, Lord, I pray, bless uh, Paul as he shares, and bless each one of us as we listen, that we may be, be blessed and enriched, we ask in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, we invite the music team back, and uh, let's sing the theme song. And please stand up uh, for the theme song.
but may that I rest all my days in the goodness of Jesus. Come and find your hope now in Jesus. He is all he said. As we usually do, uh, we have some questions uh, to answer. And let me just say that I encourage uh, all of you, uh, those who are present here, as well as those who are uh, watching us online, that you can uh, submit questions. Uh, a QR code will be displayed at the end of the uh, service, and you can use that uh, to submit your questions. Uh, the questions uh, that today uh, Paul will answer are the following. Will believers who are not keeping the Sabbath will be saved? And the other question, are the Ten Commandments graved in the stone found in a museum today? Okay. All right, so these are the questions. Let's see if uh, Paul read can read them the once answer. again. What's the first question? The first is, uh, will believers who do not keep the Sabbath be saved? And the other, uh, the, about the Ten Commandments, if it's uh, engraved in stone, found somewhere in a museum today. Okay, well, thank you, Pastor Tibor. You have brought some very interesting and difficult questions today. And by the way, we intend on Sabbath morning to answer several more questions. We have received several more questions today. We're going to answer two today, and then we will answer the rest that we have on Sabbath morning, on Saturday morning, just before we have the sermon. So will believers who are not keeping the Sabbath, will they be saved? Well, the answer to that question, I would say, is no. If a person is aware of the Sabbath, aware of God's law to keep the Sabbath and keep it holy, and they don't do so, they would be breaking his law. They would be breaking his law. So we are to obey all of the commandments, not just one. All ten of those commandments. And in Ezekiel chapter 20 and verse 20, it actually says that the Sabbath is a sign between God and his people. The Sabbath is actually a sign between God and his people. So those who keep 
the Sabbath, those who observe the Sabbath as being holy and set aside and blessed of God are indicating by their observance that they are on the Lord's side, that they are on the Lord's side. So will a believer who is not keeping the Sabbath, will they be saved? The question would, could be asked a different way. Is a person a believer if they're not keeping the Sabbath? Is a person actually a believer if they're not keeping the Sabbath? So my encouragement to the person who asked this question and to all of us, let us keep all, all of God's commandments, including the one that says, remember the seventh day to keep it holy. Remember the Sabbath day, which is the seventh day to keep it holy. Then the next question, can the Ten Commandments that were written in stone be found in a museum somewhere? Can the Ten Commandments be that are written in stone, that were written in stone, could they be found in a museum somewhere? Interestingly, tonight there are several persons who are walking around and going to art galleries and visiting very different things along the Brussels streets here, could it be that they would be able to find in one of these museums or these galleries these ten stones or then ten commandments written on stones? The answer would be no. The answer would be no. And I lead you to a text as all of these questions that I've answered for you so far come from the Bible. In Psalm 119 and verse 11. Psalm 119 and verse 11. Write this one down. It says, Thy word, thy word have I done what? Hid in my heart that I will not sin against thee. Thy word, thy law, thy precepts, thy expectations are hidden in my heart where I believe there to be God's law that I may not sin against thee. And a couple nights ago, we did talk about, as we enter these last days, before Jesus Christ will come, there will be a people, which will include you and should include me, that have the law of God written in their minds and written in their hearts. Can you go to a museum to find the Ten um, Commandments written on tablets of stone? No. Where should you look for those tablets of stone? Look in your heart. Heavenly Father, as we come tonight, we invite you in our midst. Open our minds that we will hear. Open our hearts that we will believe. And, oh God, as we look at this subject tonight, the truth about death, may we find one more truth in which we can believe. And we accept you as our Lord, our King, and our Savior. We ask these mercies in your name. Let everyone say, Amen. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Well, that was a good attempt. I heard you. I heard you. I heard you. So let's try that again. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. And oh, that's much better. I believe by the time we get to Sabbath, we're going to lift the roof and the Brussels police and the Brussels community are going to say something special or something is going on in this place. So let's try it again. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Yes, and for those of you who are online, good evening to you as well. Though we cannot hear you, we believe you are listening well and you're saying good evening as well. So, my friends, tonight we have the subject, Truth About death. And Pastor Tibor did mention in his introduction, that's not a, a nice subject. Who, who wants to die? And who wants to go through the experience of death and the experience of loss when a loved one passes away? But tonight, we will talk about death and the truth about death and find hope that is in Jesus Christ after death. So, my friends, as a recap, I think you have learned by now that I love to recap what we have done and said so far. We talked about the kingdoms of this world. There were four kingdoms. They were Babylon, 
Media Persia, Greece, and Rome. And there was not a fifth kingdom. There was a divided Europe that was um, evidenced by the feet of iron and clay. But more importantly, we understand that the kingdom of God is coming that will supersede all kingdoms that have been before. And this kingdom of God will be an everlasting kingdom. It will be an eternal kingdom. It will be a kingdom with our God. Well, how soon will this kingdom come? We remember asking this question, how quickly is quickly? How quickly is quickly? But the signs that the Lord has provided for us in Matthew chapter 24. In Matthew 24, more than 20 signs that give us an indication of how soon the Lord will come. We don't know the date. We don't know the time. But we have the signs that he has revealed to us in Matthew chapter 24 about how soon he will come. Signs in the religious world, signs in the political world, signs in the world of nature, and signs in society. We know these signs. God has provided to us in advance all of these signs so we can be aware of how soon it will be before he comes. And these signs, my friends, are being fulfilled even yet today. And as we come just before Jesus Christ will return to this earth, everyone, you and me, every single person will need to make a stand. To make a stand as to which side they are on. Do they love God or do they not love God? Do I love God or do I not love God? Every single person will need to make a stand. A stand. And the question was asked, well, how do we make that stand? How do we make that stand? And we discussed that um, two nights ago that we make that stand by baptism, this public declaration that I am on the Lord's side. This public declaration that I am on the Lord's side that does three things. One, it's a death to the old way the past way, the sinful way. It's a bearing of our sins in a watery grave of baptism and a rising up again, a resurrection, as it were, to walk in newness of life. How do we make that stand? We make that stand by choosing to be baptized. And when we are baptized in this newness of life with Jesus Christ, we obey because of our love for him, all of his commandments, including the seventh day Sabbath. We talked about last night, the seventh day, after God had created in six literal days this earth. He created light and he, he created the seas and the skies and the animals and the fish of the sea. And he, he created man and he looked at all that he had created and said it was good. And on the seventh day, on the seventh day, he rested from all of his work. And he did three things on that seventh day. He blessed it. He sanctified it. He set it apart. He made it holy. And he rested on that seventh day. And to us today, in the commandments of God, he says to us, remember, remember, remember this seventh day, this Sabbath day, to keep it holy. My friends, we were never created to die. We were never created to die. We were created to live. We are all created to live. But Adam and Eve, because of their disobedience, they were pushed out or expelled from this wonderful, beautiful place that God had created named Eden. And because of their disobedience, because of their sin, then death came into this world. There was no death before their sin. 
It was life, eternal life with Jesus Christ and God who made them in his very image. But because of their disobedience, they were expelled, taken out of that garden, that beautiful place. And because of their sin, the penalty for sin was death. So tonight, we're going to talk about this subject of death. What really happens? What really happens when you die? What really happens when you die? Now, different religions around the world have different perspectives on what happens after death. Some believe that when you die, then you are reincarnated. In other words, you come back as something else or someone else. There are religions like that. There are some who believe that when you die, then you will just go to heaven. There are some who believe that when you die, there is nothing, nothing else that happens beyond the grave. Some believe that you will go to heaven immediately. Some believe you may go to hell immediately. <clears throat> and some believe that you're somewhere in the middle, just waiting for something to happen. Many questions that are answered or asked about death. But can we find hope that goes beyond the grave? It is it possible for us to have hope beyond the grave? Are the dead asleep? Are they waiting for some resurrection when Jesus comes? Or are they in heaven already? Another question. Is the soul, is the person immortal? Does it live forever or is there some resurrection? All of these questions and where can we find the answers? And I know you're going to help me. We can find the answers in the word of God. We are searching for truth. We have been doing this for five days now. We have been searching for truth and we have been finding truth. So, so together, let's say this together. If it's in the Bible, I believe it. Let's do it again. If it's in the Bible, I believe it. If it disagrees with the Bible, it's not for me. For those of you who are online, if it's in the Bible, I believe it. If it disagrees with the Bible, it is not for me. Our topic tonight, the truth about death. And we're going to the book Revelation, this revelation of Jesus Christ himself as written by John as he was in vision and he reveals Christ. And our first passage today is Revelation 1 and verse 18. And yesterday, last night, I made a promise to a little girl. I made a promise to a little girl that I was going to bring her the mic so she could read the first verse. So I'm going to go to my little friend over here. Everybody say amen. amen. <laughs> so if you have time, Dad. Okay. <laughs> um, I am he who lives and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of hate. And of death. Okay, thank you so much. Give her a round of applause. Give her a round of applause. She did amazingly well. Thank you, Christina. You'll be our mic person tonight. I am he who lives and was dead. This is God himself speaking. I am he who lives and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and of death, or hell and the grave, whichever you may choose. So Jesus went into the grave and came out of the grave. And because he died and was buried and was resurrected, he has the keys. He has the keys over death and the grave. The, de the grave could not hold him. And he was able to be resurrected on that Sunday morning. So the Bible reveals the truth about the resurrection throughout its pages. And it points forward to the second coming. The second coming of Jesus Christ. When those who are dead will be resurrected. 
Those who are dead in Christ, those who have accepted Christ, those who believe in Christ, those who have observed his commandments, those who have observed his Sabbath, those, of, those who have been baptized and signal to the world that I am on the Lord's side. When he comes, those that are dead will be resurrected to join him. And those who may not have experienced that also will be there. So Jesus, through the pages of his word, talks about the second coming and those that are dead being able to be resurrected just as how he was resurrected. So what does the Bible teach about this idea? There are several questions that we're going to go through tonight to unpack this truth about death. What, what does the Bible teach about this idea of this immortal soul, this everlasting soul, this ever-living soul? And we go back then to the book of Genesis. The book of Genesis, the first book of the Bible, so we can understand what happened at creation, so we can better understand what happens when we die. So Genesis 2 and verse 7. Who is next? Who will read this next chapter? Christina. I'll give it back to my little friend so she at least have a couple tonight because I have to make up for not um, doing, giving it to her last night. So one more for my little friend, Emma's sister. Go. Genesis 2 and verse 7. And the Lord God formed a man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. Wow. <laughs> Give her another round of applause. She reads so well. Thank you. She reads so well. And the Lord, you know, I need to take you with me all around the world so you can read for me. That sounds so good. And the Lord formed man of what? The dust of where? The ground. And he did what? He breathed into where? His nostrils, his nose, the breath of life. And man became a what? A living soul. So let's unpack this passage. Dust plus spirit is equal to what? Say it with me. A living soul. Dust plus spirit is equal to a living soul. Another way to describe it, the, the elements of the earth, the, the dust of the earth, the elements of the earth plus breath equals a living being, a living person. So a living soul means a living person. Are we together? A living soul means a living person. So what therefore is this soul? Is it immortal? Is it something that will never die? What is this so, so we go now to Ezekiel chapter 18 and verse 4. Christina, who, who is next? Okay, go right ahead. And behold, all souls are mine. The soul of the Father as well as the soul of the Son is mine. Okay, go the ahead. The soul who sins shall die. Okay, let's do that one more time. Read it one more time. Behold. Behold, all souls are mine. The soul of the Father as well as the soul of the Son is mine. The soul who sins shall die. Okay, so another name for soul in the Bible is the person or the life. By the way, I need to take you two on my journey so you can read too. You read also wonderfully well. Another name for soul in the Bible is person or also life. So this verse says that the person who sins will die. The person who sins will die. The penalty for sin, breaking God's law, the penalty is death. So the person who sins will die. Next, next passage, it's right here. Matthew 16, verses 25 and 26. We're, we're trying to understand this soul and whether this soul is some immortal soul, some ever-living, enduring soul. We're trying to understand what is this soul. Matthew 16, verse 25 and 26. Go ahead, Emma. Forever who desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Okay, continue. 
For what profit is it to a man if he gain, gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Okay, so do you notice something here in this same passage? The interchange between life and soul. The interchange between life and soul. Whoever who desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? It didn't say life here. It used the word soul. So interchange between life and soul. Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? My dear friends, only God, only God, is immortal. Only God is immortal. Mortal means you're, you're subject to death. Immortal means it's imperishable, not subject to death. Only God is immortal. And the Bible never uses, never uses any terms that says immortal souls or the immortality of the soul. There is only one immortal being, which is God himself only one immortal being so in first timothy 1 and verse 17 who is going to read go ahead emma read this one now to the king eternal immortal immortal invisible to god who alone is wise stop right there so now to the king eternal our king or god our king who is what he is immortal only god only God is immortal. Continue, Emma. Um, God, God who alone is wise, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Okay. So go ahead and read the next part. He who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords. Okay. Keep going. Who alone has immortality dwelling in a pro inapproachable light. Mm -hmm. Continue. God alone has Im immortality. Who alone has immortality dwelling in, un in unapproachable light. My dear friends, just to repeat again, there is only one being that is immortal. And that is God himself. No one else and nothing else. But my friends, in pagan and Greek philosophy, they did teach about the immortality of the soul in pagan and Greek philosophy. But the Bible teaches that death is a sleep. Death is like a sleep. And the believer who dies is as secure as if he were sleeping in the arms of Jesus. Notice the key word, the believer who dies in this death that is asleep is as secure as if we were sleeping in the arms of Jesus. Resting from the heartaches of this world. Resting from the disappointments of this earth. And waiting for that glorious resurrection when Jesus will come. So in pagan and Greek philosophy, they believe that the soul was immortal. But in God's word, we know and are confident that only God, only God is immortal. There are others like in the spiritualism and in the New Age philosophies that they also teach about the soul that is immortal. Not just Greek and pagan philosophies, but spiritualism and New Age philosophies yet today also speak about the fact that the soul, this life, this being can also be immortal. But the devil uses this falsehood to be able to trick our minds and even to bring about instances where you might one day see a loved one who has passed away before in death and they come back to you with messages. Those messages, my friend, are only from the evil one. Because when somebody dies, they are asleep and they are dead. Any other philosophies that would suggest that their soul lives on 
and they can come back in some other form or come to you and present messages from the, 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 from the grave, that is only from the evil one. So in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 51 and verse 52, who is going to read that for us? Where is the microphone? Go ahead, Joanna. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Okay, go ahead. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpets will sound. Okay. And the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Okay, so let's do that one more time. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. So it's saying here in this passage that death is a sleep. Death is a sleep. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump when it is sound at the resurrection. And the dead, those who were dead and buried, will be raised incorruptible and will be changed. So when God created Adam, he placed breath within him, not an immortal soul, the dust of the earth, the elements of the earth, plus his breath. Man became a living soul, but not an immortal soul. Genesis 2 and verse 7. Who is going to read that? Emma or Joanna or your little sister? Who is going to read that today? Genesis 2 and verse 7. And the Lord? Um, and the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. A man uh, become a living soul. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the earth on that sixth day of creation. And he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, his own breath, into this being. And he became a living soul. So death today is actually creation in reverse. Death today is actually creation in reverse. We were not created to die. We were created to live. We were created to live. But because of sin, because of the disobedience of our foreparents, then death entered this world. And through the course of ages from then till now, we are subject to the penalty of sin, which is death. So death, my friends, is creation in reverse. So does the Bible say the soul goes back to God? What does the Bible say about this. So Ecclesiastes 12 and verse 7. Who is going to read? Elder Jacob. Then the dust will return to the earth as it was, and the spirit will return to God who gave it. Okay. So you remember what we said before that there was the elements of the earth, the dust of the earth, plus what? The breath of God. Breathing of God. And man became a living soul. So when he dies, here's what happens. The dust returns to where it came from. Where? The earth. And the spirit, the breath, will return to the God who gave it. So the body, my friend, goes back to the dust. But the spirit goes back to God. The spirit goes back to God. The Old Testament Hebrew word, for spirit is ruach, which actually means breath. The very breath, God's breath, that he breathed into us through Adam at creation morning. That breath goes back to God. So the spirit and the soul, they are indeed different. So God forms man out of the dust of the ground. That's his body. God breathes into this man his ruach in the Hebrew word, the spirit, his breath, and he became a living soul. He became a living soul, not an immortal soul, but a living soul. But because of sin, because of our foreparents, Adam and Eve, because of their disobedience, death 
was the penalty for sin. And now we have to live with the burden of loss. We have to live with the burden of separation. And when a person dies, the body goes back to the ground, to the dust from whence it came. The body goes back to the ground, to the dust from whence it came. But the spirit or the breath of life that God breathed into Adam and by extension for which we breathe today, that power of life goes back to God from whence it came. So the Bible teaches, my friends, that breath and spirit are the same thing. Breath and spirit are the same thing. Who has the microphone? Job 27 and verse 3. It's on your Bible or it's on the screen, whichever you choose. Job 27 and verse 3. Who is going to read for us? Go all, ahead. all the while my breath is mine and the spirit of God is mine. All the while my breath is in me and the spirit of God is in my nostrils. So let me try to explain this principle using an illustration here with a bulb. So now to get illumination, you need a bulb, but the bulb needs some sort of power, power to turn on the bulb. Isn't that correct? Right? That's correct, right? So we have the bulb, and then with some power, the bulb is able to give off light. It produces illumination. It produces life. But then what happens when you unplug the power source of that bulb? It goes back dark. The power goes back to where it came from. The Brussels Electrical Company, if that is a company here in Brussels, it goes back to where it came from. It stops giving off light. The same as us, the human beings, the heart stops beating in or we stop breathing, we are dead because there is no longer life. We return to the dust and our breath returns to God. So since the power to create life is with God, his spirit which gave life, it also returns to him. So is there any consciousness in death? Several questions as we look at this subject and find truth as it relates to death. Is there any consciousness in death? Who has the microphone? The next text, Psalms 146 and verse 4. Who has the microphone? Go right ahead, my friend. His breath goeth forth, he returned to his earth. In, the, in that very day, his thoughts perish. In that very day, his thoughts perish. The question we're trying to answer, is there any consciousness in death? When somebody is put below the ground and they are buried, is there any consciousness in death? The psalmist David says, his breath goeth forth, he returneth to his earth. And that very day, his thoughts perish. His thoughts perish. Perish. Continue reading Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes 9, verse 5 and 6. For the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing. How much does the dead know? Nothing. The dead know nothing. But how much do we know who are living? That we will die one day. We know we will die, but those who are dead, they know nothing because they are resting in their graves and if they are resting in Jesus they are secure in his arms and are waiting for that glorious day of resurrection to be joined with him and joined with others who may not have experienced that to go up into the heavens to live forevermore continue my dear lady also their love their hatred their envy and now I have now perished so is there any consciousness in death? No, there is no consciousness in death. Their love and their hatred, that has all perished. But also, they know nothing. They know nothing because they are asleep. So death is a sleep. There is no immortality of any soul. Death is a sleep until the second coming of Jesus Christ. 
And what a joy it would be that while we sleep, when we are dead, that we will be ready. So when he comes, we will hear his voice to come forth and be able to live with him forevermore. So Bible writers throughout the Bible more than 50 times declare that death is just a sleep. That death is just a sleep. Psalms 13 and verse 3. Where is the microphone just now? Psalms 13 and verse 3. Go right ahead, my friend. Uh, Psalms 13, 3. Consider and hear me, O Lord my God. Enlighten my eyes, lest I sleep this, this sleep of death. Yes, yeah, so consider and hear me, O Lord my God. Enlighten my eyes. This is the psalmist David as he writes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Here's an example where a Bible writer is describing death as a sleep. So one day, you may be familiar with this story. One day, Jesus and his disciples, they were traveling to visit a home and they got news about their friend and his very close friend named Lazarus, that Lazarus was sick. He got that news that Lazarus was sick, and they, they called for him to come, but Jesus waited a few more days. Some people say he delayed, but he waited a few more days and did some things, and when he got there, he heard the news that Lazarus was dead. His good friend, Lazarus, was dead. But what did Jesus himself say in John chapter 11, verse 11 through 14 about his good friend? You have the microphone, my friend. Go right ahead. Our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I may wake him again. Our friend Lazarus sleeps. They have already gotten the news that Lazarus was sick. They've already gotten the news that Lazarus was sick and has now died. And he says to his disciples, our friend Lazarus sleeps. I will go to wake him up. But then his disciples said to him, and read, continue my friend. Whoever, had, Oh, you have the microphone. Go ahead and read. I'll step aside here so you can see it. Then his disciples said, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get well. Then his disciples says, Lord, if you're saying that he's only sleeping well, he will get well. But Jesus had to make it more clear to them what he was talking about. Continue, my dear friend. However, Jesus spoke of his death. But they thought that he was speaking about talking rest in his sleep. Yes, yeah, so they thought he was just actually uh, uh, sleeping and he would get well. But Jesus was using the word sleep to mean that he was dead he was asleep. Then Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. So if there was any confusion in terms of what he meant between sleep and whether or not he would get well, Jesus said to him plainly, Lazarus is dead. His death is a sleep. And this end up would be a, a powerful testimony to all humanity about the resurrection power of Jesus Christ as, as he makes his way, as he makes his way to, to where Mary and Martha lives and makes his way to where Lazarus is laid in the grave. As he makes his way, he says to his sister, your brother will rise again. He says to his sister, your brother will rise again. Martha, don't cry. Don't cry. Praise God, I am bringing good news. Your, your brother will rise again. But what did Martha believe about death? Let's find out what she believed about death. You have the microphone. Go ahead and read. Martha said to him. Martha said to him. I know that he will rise again in the resurrection of the last day. Okay, so Martha now, in hearing what Jesus was saying to him, said, yeah, I know he'll rise again in the resurrection day. He, he's dead now. 
He's asleep now. He, he'll rise in the resurrection day. But continue on in terms of what Jesus responded to her. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, shall live. Oh, my. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die. He shall live. Those same words that Jesus spoke to Martha. Your brother will rise again. Martha saying, yes, I know he'll rise again in resurrection morning. Jesus said, I am the one who is the resurrection and the life. And though he is dead, he shall live. That same message is also for you and also for me tonight. If we believe in Jesus Christ, though we die, though we sleep in the resurrection morning, we will live again. Somebody ought to say amen. So Jesus, as he went to the tomb, said, roll, roll the stone away. Roll the stone away. It's been more than three days, four days. By this time, Lazarus is not only dead, he is very dead. But by this time, he's not only dead, he, he's dead to the, the stage of stink death. He's stinking now. He says, roll, roll the stone away. And he calls out, being the one as the resurrection and the life. And he calls Lazarus by his name. Calls Lazarus by his name. Lazarus, come forth. Lazarus that was sleeping, resting in God's love, came out of that grave and lived again. The day will come when Jesus comes back to this earth. He will call you by name if you were to die. He will call me by name if I were to die. Lazarus, come forth. Paul, come forth. Come forth. For I am the resurrection and the life. So death, my friends, no matter how discouraging it might be, death, my friends, no matter how disheartening it might be, death is just asleep. Waiting for the resurrection morning for those whose lives are in Christ Jesus. Job chapter 14 Verse 21. Who has the microphone? Job chapter 14 and 21. Where is the microphone? Go right ahead, Elder. If their children are honored, they do not know it. If their offspring are brought low, they do not know it. So even when we come to gravesides and we come to memorialize our lost loved ones, they have no perception that we have come. We may come just to soothe our grief, but they have no perception that we have come. A lost husband, a, a lost wife, a lost mother, a lost son, a lost grandmother. As we mourn them, they have no idea for they are just asleep. Can you imagine if somebody were to die and they were to be in heaven. Just imagine if my mother who has passed away and I look forward to that day when I will see her again, that if she was just up in heaven right now and looking down at me, maybe um, really living a very riotous and, and unproductive and sinful life, well, how would she feel if that's what she was looking down on earth to see what was going on with her lovely and dear son. My, my dear friends, God is too merciful for that. Death is just a sleep. When we die, our bodies return to the dust of the ground. And the spirit and the breath goes back to him who gave it, which is God himself. So death is a state of perfect rest or sleep. Until the resurrection morning when Christ wakes us up and say, now all sorrow is over. Enough of the suffering, enough of the sickness, enough of the death. Rise up as we now go to live eternal life together. 
The dead do not praise the Lord, nor any who go down in silence. They are just asleep. So my friends, in more than 1,600 places in the Bible where it mentions soul, mentions the soul, it never talks about this immortal soul. It talks about death being asleep. Then on resurrection morning, those who are dead in Christ, those who have believed in Jesus Christ, those who have accepted his gift of salvation by him, paying that penalty, that sentence of death for our sin on Calvary's cross, those who have accepted it, those who have chosen then to be baptized as a public declaration of being on the Lord's side, those who have through love, been obedient to all of his commandments, including the seventh day Sabbath, will arise to the sound of their name when God calls them by name. Arise, I am the resurrection and the life. And we go with him to live in eternity forevermore. On that day, my friends, the graves are opened and we ascend with Jesus Christ, our Lord. I'm longing for that day. I'm longing for that day. I'm longing for that day, not just for myself to see my Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm longing for that day to see my Father. To see my Father who he heard this message of salvation. As a young man, standing at the gate of a church many years ago. And as he stood there and listened to the preacher, the preacher says, if anyone in the sound of my voice will hear this message and not accept Christ, they cannot be saved. He heard that message and he walked in off the street, went into that church and gave his life to Christ. He was then baptized 20 years later as a minister of the gospel, he baptized his own son in that same church. What a wonderful God whose message goes from generation to generation, whose love is from generation to generation, whose blood is for everyone, and whose sacrifice on Calvary is for you and for me. I am longing for that day. To see my father. I'm longing for that day to see my mother. I'm longing for that day to see my little girl who was born and just 12 hours later she died. I'm longing for that day for they are just asleep and waiting for that day when Jesus will little ones who have passed away, reunited with their parents. Parents united with their children. Husbands reunited with their wives. Daughters reunited with their parents. Reunited because death is just asleep. So death is a subject that could be difficult. But there's life beyond the grave. There's life and there is hope beyond the grave. And that's the truth about death. That Jesus has the keys to death and the grave. For he was crucified on my cross and your cross. He was buried in a grave. But he was resurrected into life and has the keys to death and the grave. So though he died our death and paid our price, by doing so, we can have life and hope after the grave. That's the truth about death, my friends. Nothing to fear, for God has overcome for you and for me. So my dear friends, 
we have been studying since Saturday night till now, various truths. We have been searching his word, his true and timeless and trustworthy word for these various truths. And we've been answering questions through his Bible, questions that you've had before and questions that came up in your mind as you've been here this week. You've been studying. Those of you who are here and those of you who have been online, you've been studying and you've been listening. And some of you have been struggling. You, you, you're starting to believe and you're understanding that this God, he, he loves you. And this God has a hope and a, a life for you beyond the present life. And you're starting to feel that tug in your heart that there's something different about what I've heard. That's the Spirit of God trying to tell you something that he loves you and he has a world and a life beyond this present life. So my appeal is simple to you. If you feel that tug in your heart, if you feel that tug in your mind, it is time for you to declare publicly, Lord, I want to be on your side. I want to be on your side. I could even say it a little bit differently. A little bit differently. It is better for you to believe in what you have heard and it not turn out to be true than for you to believe, do nothing, and it turns out to be true. It's better for you to believe and it doesn't turn out but for you to believe do nothing, and it turns out to be true. God, my friends, loves you and loves me so much that he wishes for none of us to perish, but for all of us to come to repentance and for all of us to live with him in eternal life. So on this Sabbath, we will have a baptism. We will have those who have decided already to make a public stand to be on the Lord's side. For those of you who are online and for those of you in the room, if you have not made that decision as yet, now, now is the time. Now is the time before it's forever too late. Now is the time. So before I leave here tonight, I'm going to stand right here after I pray. And if you believe in your heart that God is telling you something, and God has a plan for your life beyond this life, and you want to stand on his side, come talk to me, and we'll prepare you for baptism on this Sabbath. Come talk to me. And we'll prepare you for baptism on this Sabbath. Now is the time. Not tomorrow. Not next week. Now is the time. And regardless of what anyone may say to you or put any obstacles in your way, it is better to be on the Lord's side. So come talk to me afterwards and let us work that journey to baptism on sabbath heavenly father heavenly father we're just so thankful for your word we're just so thankful for your sacrifice on calvary we're thankful for your creative power when you kneel down and out of the dust of the earth you created man you created adam and you breathe into him your breath and he became a living soul. Yes, he was disobedient. And because of his disobedience, it caused death into this world. But because of your love and your own sacrifice, you, you paid the price 
that we should pay in death. You paid the penalty. You went to that cross that should be our cross. Your death, your burial, your resurrection is what we now have for the opportunity to have eternal life with you. So, oh God, we look forward to your soon return. When we can see our loved ones once again, we look forward to your soon return when there will be no more death, no more sickness, no more pain. We, we look forward to your soon return when we can behold you as our King of kings and our Lord of lords. Lord, we know you're coming quickly and even just now, even just now, there are persons in this room and there are persons online who are faced with a decision that they need to make. We ask, oh God, through your spirit to surround them just now and help them to understand into your arms, into your love, that is where they belong. So in this moment of silence, we allow your spirit to pervade this room and pervade the homes of those who are online. And God, those who are making decisions right now, give them the strength to do so and seal their commitment with you is our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Good evening. Sorry. <laughs> it's always the same, so it's a bit complicated. <laughs> so in the same time, I just tell you that it's in French, and um, I just translate it in English. So that you can...
je me tiens devant Beautiful song, and thank you for the powerful message that we have heard uh, tonight. We'll meet again tomorrow evening, the same time, and we'll have uh, the topic on uh, truth about God's end time plan. Then on Saturday, we will meet in the morning. Uh, at 9.30, we'll have a Bible study time. And at 11 o'clock, uh, our last topic, uh, the truth about heaven will be presented, but also some questions will be answered. So I encourage you to uh, write the questions, uh, send uh, to us the questions, so uh, Paul will be prepared to answer those questions. And it's very important to note that we will have, as it was just a moment ago mentioned, 
a baptismal service at uh, 3 o'clock on Saturday afternoon. So we will have a full day on Saturday, a baptismal service. And uh, as uh, you receive the invitation, if you are contemplating and you would like to, please come if you are here and uh, meet with the Paul and uh, the others, the elders. Uh, and uh, those of you who are online, you can use this QR code not only to send your questions, but also communicate to us your desire, and then we will uh, contact uh, you, we will be connected and, uh, and arrange for a meeting. That's all the information I believe uh, tonight I need to share. Uh, after uh, we finish here, don't run away, we have some uh, refreshment uh, uh, prepared and we can share a little time together and uh, meet and, and talk. Otherwise, uh, have a good night and see you tomorrow evening.